and by being now online, I think we can continue with lecture seven here from the reinforcement learning course, which is called actually um, planning and learning with with tabular methods. So let's maybe start with a little recap what we have learned so far in the lecture course. So um, I think you have seen this figure already once. And um, in the beginning of the lecture, you dealt with some model-based algorithms, especially, I think, in lecture four with dynamic programming, after we've learned something about value functions and action value functions, um, where in dynamic programming, you use the knowledge, the perfect knowledge of a model to come up with, predict some, some values for uh, how good it is to be in one state and to come up with that, maybe with a policy, so how to interact with the environment. I think in the lecture, uh, in the exercises, you've dealt with that be a bachelor example, where the first task was to figuring out like, okay, um, what kind of model do we have here, build it up, and then use dynamic programming to solve this stuff. Afterwards, you continued here with um, model free reinforcement learning approaches, where the first shot was Monte Carlo. We just run an episode till it's terminated and then learn from that. After that, you started with bootstrapping methods, so um, like these uh, temporal difference learning methods. And these methods learned only like from interacting with the environment, they didn't need a model. And today, um, we will see maybe if we can draw any benefits from that to combine these two areas with each other. So like model-based and model-free reinforcement learning. What, what are the drawbacks of each? What are, what are the benefits? And how can we use this maybe to improve our learning? Yeah, and since um, the lecture is called with tabular methods, we are still dealing here with finite state and action spaces. And spoiler alert, from next week on, we will leave that finite state and action spaces where you can represent your, your state space just by matrices and come up with continuous tasks where Willem starts to introduce function approximators, where we'll start with um, artificial neural networks to yeah, learn more complicated and fancy stuff. But today we will deal only with finite state and action spaces so far. Okay, a little bit of content for today. Yeah, that's better. Okay, um, we will start with a small repetition on like what we need from um, model-based and model-free reinforcement learning um, to combine the benefits both provide to improve the learning. And combining this into an algorithm, we will then learn how we can use this in the Diner algorithm we will investigate later on. And figuring out what like are the benefits from that compared to no model usage. And maybe how can we improve even this algorithm. There we will get to know uh, the method which is called prioritize sweeping. And in the end, I will give a really brief outlook in like changing the idea of using the model in case of direction. Here we will just look in backward experience and here in the last step planning at decision time means like okay we make now a decision and plan so we will change our direction into the future. But just as a brief outlook there are whole lectures about that. <coughs> Okay, uh, by the way, if you have questions or stuff, just interrupt me, let me know, and I'll try to answer. Okay, um, yeah, a little bit of recap, like just said, model-based reinforcement learning, um, like temporal difference learning. So, um, we are you used, um, um, sorry, like uh, dynamic programming. 
Um, you use dynamic programming, for example, to plan or predict a value function and gather a policy from that based on the model knowledge you had on that. And yeah, of course, therefore, um, we re required a perfect, um, a perfect knowledge about the, the model in a priori, or maybe we can learn from some experience that model. Um, we'll see from today on, and that could help us then to solve um, control or prediction task in that case. But um, maybe we start, before we discuss about like how we can come up with a model, maybe what a model is just once again. And if the question, if any question here in reinforcement learning course, the answer, correct answer might often be MDP. Can keep that maybe in mind for uh, for your exam. Um, so, what is a model? We will uh, label a model from now on with that curly M over here, and we've got to know a model so far as an MDP, which just consists out of a tuple of information. And I think you have seen all these variables in beforehand, in particular like just introduced in that. Be a bachelor example where you first task modeled like uh, state transition probability from bar to bar. I think weighted with policy, but anyways. So first thing we need is a state transition probability. So I uh, I am in state X apply an action. How likely it is that I transit to that next state here? Uh, the same goes for reward. So um, um, we need a reward probability curly uh, uh, R for our model as well. In the most application cases, especially from the last exercises with the car example, I think the reward was deterministic. But in the beer bachelor example, uh, in the beer bachelor exercise, for example, I think in the last task there was an exercise where some happy hour came into the game and you were not sure about like if I gather maybe or save my money for investing in my bachelor. Um, and there was an example for a stochastic reward. So could be like deterministic or stochastic in case of probability here. Um, then we have our state and action spaces, X and U, which be assumed from our part of viewpoint as known. So if you have a technical system and you want to control it, maybe a motor or whatever, um, you, you typically know which quantity you want to control and maybe out of the data sheet, like what is the maximum current I can push through this plant before it blows up. And on the other hand, for your action space, you typically know like how to, uh, what amount of voltage do I have available to apply to the system or in a car, like how much throttle can I give? Like this is to be known. And the last point, which is often um, missing on the mind, is the discount factor, which comes into play when we start learning by discounting future rewards. And um, yeah, the discount factor might be given by the environment, or maybe in our cases, since we want to design an agent who controls our system, is often an engineer's choice and can be then later on optimized in a hyperparameter optimization, I think you will cover in the last lecture. Okay, so um, what kind of model is available? Um, yeah, perfect world would be we have perfect knowledge of our system in a priori, and we know our true MDP, which for example, could be the case if you think about games, and you have a game you want to play and you have knowledge about like how the rules are and how the setting is and you might be able to fully model that. Um, but yeah, maybe that's often thought too easy because like for example, if you think about you have an opponent in this game and you might not know how your opponent will react on you. But from your viewpoint, like it seems or the, the opponent player is part of your environment you have to interact with, right? So in most cases or real-world application cases, 
you um, might need to learn the model and you could only come up with an approximated model. We will in the following um, mark with that curly M hat in here. Um, yeah, so what can we do to learn our model in the framework of reinforcement learning we have got to know so far? <laughs> Yeah, like just said, in many real-world applications might be too complex um, to come up with a real model, and therefore we want to estimate a model. So, but if you think about our reinforcement learning applications, we have got to know so far, uh, we are somewhat interacting with the environment and gathering experience from that, right? And using that experiment, uh, experience, um, we have trained our agent. So we have some kind of information of the environment available, like um, how it reacts in a specific state on our action with like another state and a feedback for how good it was. And that's simply that experience here I'm talking about. So you're in current state, you apply an action, get a reward and get to another state. And the task, if you want to identify our model, is just simply some kind of supervised learning task or system identification task. So we need just uh, some kind of tool which links these uh, current state and action I've taken in that state to the state where it, uh, like the environment leads me to and like how good it was. And this I have several times available. So we have a simple system identification or supervised learning task in here. And um, yeah, the easiest approach to come up with a model from that is just like a simple lookup table, right? A buffer or maybe um, yeah, just, just counting. It depends on if your environment is stochastic or um, deterministic. Here is an example for the application in a stochastic environment. So we're just simply counting like how many times we've been in that state, taken that action and come up into that state and divide the number by that like transitions we observed by the amount of visits we have been in that state and action pair. And like if you do this forever, then you uh, like till infinity come up with a very good approximation for the probability if I am in state X, take action U, like how likely it is to get to stay to the state X prime, right? So it's very basic approach, but can already help us much to improve our learning. We will see now. The same yeah, goes for the reward. Like we can even just count and divide by the number, of course, here weighted by the reward we get from the environment, like to um, to validate if that action was good or not good. Yeah, mm, if we then could come up with the perfect knowledge about or like perfect approximation uh, about uh, the state transition probability, um, we have a very strange tool at hand and this type of models are called distributional models. Um, so like just said, distributional models have um, the state transition probability and knowledge about the reward probability. So um, yeah, this has full explanatory power and um, it's really hard to get a really good approximation for a distribution model. If you think, by the way, if I'm talking too fast or too slow, just like, let me know, okay? First time for me lecture. Um, okay, distributional model. Um, example, so think about you have 10 dice and you want to model that 10 dice. For a distributional model, so, so of course the experiment, like you want to know the outcome of the sum of that dice. Um, the distributional model, you would need like um, every result which could come uh, for the sum, which could come up out of that 10 dice weighted by the probability that sum could arrive. 
like this is maybe hard, but not. It's an easy example, so that's possible. But like if the example gets more complicated, it's, it's, it will not be coming easier. Um, what would be quite of easy? Just take the dice, throw them, and just count what's there, right? And that would be like you make an experience, you see the result. That's also a model, and experience we can use then later on for learning. And these type of models are called sample models. So sample models, like just said, I just throw the dice, get a realization out of that. And I use then these experiments I've simulated to learn before maybe I interact with my environment once again. Of course, if you have a distribution model at hand, it's quite simple to use that distribution model to realize samples. So like then you, can, then you have your sample realization. Um, but yeah, if you, for example, think about, I think here Oliver mentioned this uh, blackjack example you have got to know in lecture five with Monte Carlo, um, where like it, what, uh, it was, uh, that, that would be quite hard since you have also um, an opponent in this game and do not know how it will react to come up with a real distribution model. For all like possibilities your opponent could take, and but it's just quite easy to I don't know on the internet or program yourself just a blackjack simulator, and use this for learning, while before you interact with your real blackjack in the casino again. I'm not sure if that's legal, but um, that's another kind of problem. Okay, mm, there was a small recap on model-based reinforcement learning, what models are, and like how can we come up with models if we have no clue. Anything so far? The other point was re model-free reinforcement learning. And like just stated in the beginning, from model-free reinforcement learning, um, we the target was to learn value functions or policies from experience. So I have no model at hand, I have an environment, I can throw actions at that environment, get state feedback and a reward, and I just do this and learn from that experience. Uh, experience. And if you, if you see that, that red mark verb here, um, maybe to notice that in model free reinforcement learning we call this learning and in model based reinforcement learning where we know everything about our environment we call that planning right because we have the knowledge and we can just use it i think in in one of the first lecture max showed like in one shot to come up with a prediction task right um yeah cool requires no model at all yeah that's obvious so we can just interact with our environment so that's quite easy to implement if I have an environment and algorithms you got to know Monte Carlo, Sasa or Q learning algorithms which do not require some state transition probability for the learning and what we will do today like figuring out how can we enhance these algorithms especially we will grab ourselves that Q learning down here and how can we enhance this if we assume that we just said, okay, we have experience, we learn with IQ learning from experience, and we just discussed, okay, we can even use that experience like to build up a model, right? And um, how can we combine this model to learn from that model additionally to our interaction um, with the environment to gather experience? And that's basically shown here. So our target is like um, we want to come up with a prediction task to figure out the values of the states or we want like a control task, a policy to, I don't know, drive a car, not against the wall. We are acting with that car and we gather some experience and we train our agents. So that's model-free direct reinforcement learning here, right? And today we will use that experience we gathered to on the side learn a model and use this model then for planning and a little spoiler motivation right here i mean why is this maybe useful 
for example, if you think about real world, real time problems, right? And you have a control task. For example, Jaron in his lab wants to control a filter, like a current through that filter. And uh, you have one over 10 kilohertz time for that. What would it be 100 microseconds? Yeah, great. Um, milliseconds, yes. 100 micro, great. Okay. Um, and let's say um, he has an, an agent which could somewhat do that. But it takes 50 microseconds, like to um, so he has to interact every 100 microseconds and send a new action, and his policy calculation stuff here takes 50 microseconds, so only half of the time, to, and half of the time he is just waiting till he has to send a new action. We could use this time to train a model with the experience we gathered from that interaction, and if we have a model available, we can use like the half of the time instead of waiting just for training our agent to get better faster right and that's that's basically the motivation so i think i will tell this on the next slide once again but like for me motivation is most important for like listening so okay mm. yeah advantages and drawbacks Model-free versus model-based reinforcement learning. Um, model-based reinforcement learning, of course, here are, to my mind, only advantages listed. Like, uh, we can um, effect, uh, efficiently uh, use the limited amount of data. Like just said, okay, we get only every, I don't know, TS second an experience, and we have time left, we can efficiently use this time like to, to retrain. Um, Model-based model reinforcement learning allows us to uh, integrate a priori knowledge. So, I don't know, if you have an electrical system you want to control and you might have knowledge about the filter in that case, so the inductance and the capacitance, you, you want like to control the voltage about the capacitance, you have data sheet values. But they have maybe tolerance, so uh, you have maybe an appro uh, approximation for like what that capacitance would be, and you can maybe then uh, integrate some a priori knowledge which you improve over the experiment. Last point is learned models might be reused for other tasks, e.g., monitoring. Okay, to my mind, yeah, monitoring is great, but um, there are many other cool really fancy applications you can do with that so like just like i introduced you can use this model to evaluate your actions if you know your model is right i can predict or somewhat see if i will blow up the system so you can use this also maybe for for safety issues depends on the model and it's a little bit not that easy but just for motivation at least for my side Model free reinforcement learning, of course, it comes with the benefits that it's quite easy to implement, right? So, uh, in case of you have the algorithm, you can just do it. And if you think about real time control and about the time issue, it's only one task you have, you have to solve. There's nothing maybe you parallelize to different threads, or uh, you have to look like how, many how much time do I have left for when do I stop the, the planning. So that's Im easy to implement and yeah, it's not affected by um, model bias or any error. So like, think about if I learn based on a model and the model is bullshit, then I learn bullshit. So maybe uh, that's, that's an issue we will, we will figure out today as well. Um, we'll get hard when you think about safety, but today we just do maze examples. So safe maze. Okay, cool. So we have recapped model-based and model-free reinforcement learning to like the idea how to use a model. So let's just do it. Um, our first algorithm we will investigate today is called Dyna, where we integrate what I've just said. And yeah, Dyna was proposed by uh, Richard Sutton in the 90s already. Um, that's the guy, who, one guy of, of the, the book we are somewhat following in our lecture. And the general framework is, is shown over here. So um, we just basically saw this, but, but that's a Dyna framework. So um, 
here is our policy or value function. We want like to predict uh, or to, to fulfill a control task. So, so that's our reinforcement learning agent. And this agent is interacting with our environment. So your, your TD agent from last week, which wants to drive a car down here. And um, yeah, maybe we think about like a real world application where that agent really steers a car. So you gather information from that and got real experience. This experience you use for direct reinforcement learning to like improve the outcome of that policy function or value function. And on the side, maybe if time is left for the stuff, um, you use that experience to learn a model for that car you're just steering. And this model then you use, you, you pick in a somehow more or less clever way, we will discuss experience from your model in the search control to use simulated experience to train your policy during your waiting to interact with the real environment once again. Right? Okay, so there's basically um, three, diff uh, three important parts in Dyna, um, which we will like investigate now ever and ever again and try to improve the setting since we figured out maybe a uh, drawback. So we have direct reinforcement learning, which could be any model-free uh, algorithm like Q-learning, like Sasa. Today we will use Q-learning, will become then DynaQ. Um, we have model learning. Model learning could be like a tabular case, so you use that distribution model. Um, I've explained on that how to approximate a state transition probability by just counting, or much simpler, we just grab a buffer, right, and store that experience. So an experience simply consists of, I am in a state, I take an action, I go to the next state, get a reward. That's an experience. Just grab that, take that, and reuse it. That's it, in a ring buffer, whatever. Um, yeah, that's maybe not feasible for, or quite hard at least, to come up with a distribution estimation model here, like uh, in 7.3, if, if the... Um, state and action space increases and you will see this from next week on like with the with the problems we've dealt so far there were like small state and action spaces for that maze example we will see um soon or the car even like that was not that huge but if you think about i don't know um a mountain car maybe let's 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 stick to the uh, control the voltage across a filter like um, typically, you m might want to be possible to adjust every voltage between, I don't know, minus 300 and plus 300. That would be like infinity state and action space, right? So-called continuous. That might be quite hard, even if you discretize this with a high discretization, like to come up with a distribution model. So therefore, you can use function approximators, which could be artificial neural networks, which learn based on that space. Um, or there are other system identification tasks, uh, tricks, which are tools which are quite cool. And there I can maybe uh, hint, give a hint to the next semester where Oliver also has another lecture on system identification, um, where he talks about all the methods. But we will today stick with quite easy and see how that easy approach can already help us to improve our learning with this like, simple buffer here. Okay, um, talked a lot about model learning. We wanted to figure out like the parts of Dyna here, right? Direct model learning, search control is the last one, which might be, uh, okay, I don't know, you, you have a model at hand and you use some experience out of that, whatever. We will, we will see, but there's a strategy how to grab that information. And like there might be ways how you grab clever information or maybe not so clever. But um, yeah, first approach maybe would be just random out of in our information, right? And that's basically what Dyna does. So um, here is that beautiful pseudocode you might all know. 
by the way, just a question, like that pseudocode stuff here, is it like worth to explain this in detail or just wrap over it quite fast or what do like out of your experience from, from the other lectures? So, something in the middle, okay. All right, yeah, <laughs> great, great uh, political answer. Um, <laughs> okay, if, if, I, if I talk too much, you can maybe just <laughs> give me a hint. Um, and to last as well. Okay, um, DynaQ, yeah, um, we throw some parameters into our algorithm. I mean, that's basically the stuff you will later on program in the lecture, in the exercise, right? Um, so we have our parameter alpha, like our learning rate, like Apple. Uh, we have a new parameter which is called n, uh, which is here the number of planning steps per real step. So how often do I interact with my model before I have to interact with my real environment once again? Um, we have a Q function we want to approximate. Since this is Q learning, we want to predict state action values and to come up with a policy. We have a model approximated m hat here. Uh, which is dependent on the state and the action I've chosen in that state. So, mm, let's start. We start our learning episodes from a state and like Q-learning, we choose an action in that state from a policy, apply that action, observe our experience here. Then we apply Q-learning. I won't explain this one here. You have got to know this in the last lecture to improve our policy on that state action pair. That's Q-learning. Here comes now the new stuff, DynaEdge. So this was our direct reinforcement learning part and now comes our planning part. So we take that experience we've just gathered and throw this in some kind of matrix, vector, tuple, whatever uh, gadget in the programming language you use where you can store for that state and action the reward and the state where it led you. And then you do n planning steps and um, you, like I just said, you just sample randomly out of the states which have been visited. So of course we, we would have to be once in that state and put it into our model. Um, then we take randomly an action we have chosen in that state and use our model which maybe has a lot of experience in already and um, grab the result where the environment led us to. And to, to reuse this experience here then in that Q learning, and now like if you see here the, the modeled experience we have uh, marked with that tilde here. And we reapply this to once again do Q learning. That's it. Quite simple, right? Okay. Mm, yeah, three steps, like discussed, direct RL update is Q-learning here in our case. Um, as model, we've using, we are using a simple buffer, so could be a ring buffer or whatever, um, and a search strategy, search, search strategy, great, um, is here, like just draw random where we have been. So in the very first step, when we only have one experience, basically, mm -hmm. the Q-learning update from the model tree approach and the Q-model Q update below would be the same then, because we have the, the, only this one data point, which we then have to sample in the for loop, and then that's the same. Yeah. Yeah. It, it will be somewhat ever the same of experience we have investigated in beforehand. But of course, if our model is quite empty in the beginning and we have not much experience in there, I, I think there are ways like to do. You can say, okay, I first start when, when I have that amount of data of experience in my buffer, as many steps I want to do, or like other strategy is like, I don't care, I, I, I have the time, I want to learn from only that one experience already. Both could be motivated, but yeah, that's true. Cool. Anything else to that algorithm? Okay. Um, Q-learning, buffer, search strategy, random. Okay, great. 
Um, maybe just a little hint from my side. So um, if you think about that parameter n, you, I think, got to know this last week in n-step n -step bootstrapping method, uh, n-step td, right? Where it also was called n. And it's, again, like n times interacting with our now modeled environment. So same effect, but different meaning here, OK? It's not bootstrapping, um, um, but now we will interact with our model n times. If we do not use our model or set n to 0, obviously we will come up with q learning, right? So we just not use the part below and we have q learning. And yeah, I think I talked a lot about that stuff here to, to motivate you all for like the sense of model learning. But um, you can assume this planning as a background task to mention it again like if you have time left over before you have to interact with your real environment use that time in a clever way to maybe teach the agent as fast as possible not to drive against the wall stochastic environments like mentioned i think already once um, the buffer maybe is not sufficient because uh, maybe it's better to come up with some kind of distributional model and to approximate the state transition probability for that. And of course, we can then exchange our updates, not with that Q-learning max, but maybe with an expected update, where you take into account the probability of the state transition weighted by the like update for the next Q values, right? But OK, mm, yeah, let's apply it, Dinah just to an example and see <coughs> what it gives. So mm, here we've got one of the beautiful maze examples. We have here that maze um, where the agent starts here on the S and has to reach the goal called G. He cannot leave that maze and cannot enter these grayish areas over here. The actions are right, left, up and down. And if he wants to leave the maze or go into an obstacle, it just stays where it came from. Okay, the reward is like everywhere zero besides if I enter the goal. There I get like a cookie and um, get a reward of one. We, of course, we have an episodic task. Our episode is over when we reach the goal. Um, we have a discount factor given by the environment now, step size, and we have an exploration rate. And what we will see now are always average learning curves to somewhat average out, out randomness, which in our case, comes into account with that epsilon here, which is uh, based on random generator. So um, what we see here is how many steps the agent needs to terminate the episode, so to reach the goal it, within the learning over the different episodes, so basically somewhat of learning curves. The bluish line here is with zero planning steps. So the number in the front here is our n we've just investigated. Um, the green is five planning steps and the um, red down here is 50 planning steps. And what, can, what we can see is that um, the zero planning steps, which is basically Q-learning, takes a while to like find the optimal path to the maze. So down here on this, this line, this means we need 14 steps, which I counted that is somewhat that way here, um, to the goal. So it needed about, I don't know, below, below 30. Um, five planning steps. So we just reapply in the, uh, before we interact with our environment once again, five times what we have experienced so far. That's cool. a little bit faster. And with 50 planning steps, already up to three episodes, we have found the optimal policy just out of learning, of, out of our experience. Of course, maybe one could say maybe an unfair comparison. I mean, I need the time for 50 planning steps, like before I have to interact with my environment again. But yeah, maybe let's see on the next slide why that n equals 50 is that much better than the Q learning. Or is that example clear here? Okay, what we see here is the policy, the agent with zero planning steps, Q learning and 50 planning steps has within 
half of the second episode. So we have seen our target here once and our uh, state action values of all that space here have been initialized with zero, like we always do. So um, after the first episode, based on our update rule for queue, uh, for queue learning, we have updated here our policy with a non-zero value for queue learning only in one of the states, right? Because here, everywhere, we just get a reward of zero, all the queue functions were zero, so we updated zero on zero, that's zero. Um, so that, that bluish line, uh, that bluish arrow here just indicates, okay, the agent in that state thinks, so the policy, the highest Q value is for going upwards. In comparison to the 50 planning steps over here, it's also in the second episode, the agent has already a plan and a policy for like half or more than half of the state space, right? Of course, in the beginning, after the first episode, both agents like had only an update here on the last step because everything was zero. But within the second episode, that guy over here used reused this information where you just ask like, will it be the same? Like that will be the same, which is not zero then. Um, over and over again and come up with some kind of idea where how to reach that goal with, without founding, uh, finding that goal a second time. And already, like we, we saw in the, in the learning curve and beforehand, uh, already in the, in the third episode, so uh, or after the third episode, it has found the optimal policy like to go this way here and find the goal in 14 steps. So that's a cool thing about planning, if I have the time for that and a model which is kind of useful. Okay, questions? Some comments? I mean, what, what, what about, like, I just, I just said um, if our model is some kind of useful, right? What is this if our model might be wrong and I learn on, on I learn a policy on wrong data? It's maybe not, not the best idea or it could lead to some issues and that's what we investigate in another example, another grid, uh, maze example, um, which you see over here. So um, we apply again to this example here, Dyna, the bluish line and a variant of Dyna, which is red. I will explain that on the next slide, but let's first take a look to motivate ourselves. So um, we have here the time, so the time steps we interact with our environment and like both have the same amount of planning time. I don't know, it's not listed here. Um, and the goal is like to start here to reach that goal. And within the first th uh, 3,000 interactions with the environment, uh, the environment looks like this. So the agent, somewhat both of them, find the way through that gap here on the left and do this ever and ever again. We can see in our cumulative reward. So like um, in the beginning, they need some time and they do not get a reward. But then when they when they found the game, uh, the goal once, uh, that curve here increases somewhat linear. And we can see they found the optimal policy and find the goal. And then after 3,000 steps here, a shortcut is opened, and like, which somewhat reflects what we thought about this state here in the, in the beginning of the training and put all the information maybe in our buffer is now wrong because there is no obstacle, but we can pass you through, right? And it's more valid like, to go this way because it's shorter and I can grab a cookie faster and can get fat faster. Um, and yeah, that would be kind of cool. And we see here, Dinah simply doesn't realize that. And it doesn't find this. It, it reapplies his knowledge about the old model and the old environment ever and ever again. But DynaQ Dyna Plus does. So maybe let's take a look what DynaQ Plus is. Is that uh, without the exploration factor? Good question. The the Mark is away. Jaron, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, yes, uh, so BOSIS with exploration. Uh, I thought about if I asked this question, but thank you. So um, both are exploring, but uh, only epsilon greedy. Um, so what you maybe could do or could think about from the question of Jaren, just increase the exploration factor and try to find that gap here then by randomness. But obviously, uh, I don't know, we do not have any information about the epsilon here, but it's epsilon greedy. Maybe it's too low, like just to, to find that gap. Even DynaQ should be possible, but we have to push up exploration. And I don't know if we can fall down here from the cliff, maybe like in one of that examples, pushing up exploration might not be, I don't know, might be hard, but um, maybe we can do this in a more clever way as well. And that's what DynaQ does. So it simply adds two um, extensions to DynaQ. And the first is a simple search heuristic, which is it edits to an, an offset to the reward of kappa times square root of tau. Clear so far, right? Okay. Um, tau in that case here is uh, the number of time steps a state action transition has not been tried. And kappa is simply a scaling factor. So if we go back, yeah, back. So um, maybe if the agent in the beginning here found the path and just took it ever and ever again just to grab cookies, um, that factor here, or it will maybe not come into the region down here, right? Um, and if I do not visit the states down here, uh, DynaQ Plus tells me I add like scaling, whatever, take it to 0 0.5 um, times tau, which is the number of time steps I haven't been in that state. And if it's by random exploration from that epsilon greedy search, uh, takes a step which hasn't been visited so far, we add an offset to the reward and it learns like to think about that is a good way, maybe. And it forces it to explore states where, where which it hasn't seen. So, and that's how it like can find that path here and reach the goal. Somewhat indirectly from that learning. Yeah, the other thing is, um, which is maybe not that obvious, but helpful, um, we somewhat fill up our whole model by some information. So uh, for actions for given states that never had been tried before, we just assume in our model, so throw into our buffer fake experience, which just tells us, okay, this just leads back to the same state without any reward. But using that, we can take this into account with our counting and maybe visit them to figure out if that's maybe a gap to the cookie. And like with these two tricks, which are based on exploration somewhat, we can like fight some model errors or model changes in a maybe clever way. Are you cool with Dyna Q and Dyna Q plus? At all? Yeah? So with our model, we wouldn't have the shortcut there which wasn't the change. Mm -hmm. Then with Dyna Q plus algorithm, would it then be worse than the Dyna Q algorithm? Because we try out states we probably should not try out since we have an ideal model there. Interesting point. Um, yeah. But being higher in the graph is that better? Because we have higher yeah, that, that, yeah, it somewhat means like, okay, here it's, it learns the way faster, right? And increases faster. But due to your comment, like, it would be the other way around, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so you might have discovered the maximal, but that doesn't necessarily mean that 
field type of stuff. So here there's two simple ways through it. When you introduce a shortcut, you can introduce a, another potential maxima. Yeah, but I mean, there is no other shortcut. There is no yeah, if, 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 the, if the model is true, I may, may, maybe maybe the, the the always wise answer it is is it depends, but uh, I mean it could could be that uh, based on you have somewhat put in a model for all your state action values that you somewhat come up with a more improved exploration even in the beginning and that's why Dyna Q plus finds maybe the goal here faster compared to epsilon greedy. I think you would have to investigate that heuristic search stuff based on the hyperparameters you give in there. Plus, like, you start with a model of your whole state space here, right? And you've thrown in zeros, but whatever, uh, I, I think you will somewhat uh, force your agent in another way to explore the system. But I am somewhat with you that there might be also cases that, where it could be a drawback Maybe this is a quite nice example because you have only one gap here and if you explore in a good way and find it faster, you're like good to go to be faster. But I, I get your point and I share it somewhat. That it depends on like, I think there might be ex examples as well where it's the other way around. But yeah question is like um, maybe about the environment if it's likely to change or not and you can play then with the parameters but yeah good point got it and share it other thoughts to that point maybe I don't know we can even start discussions <laughs> but or other questions other ideas how to improve Dyna. We have applied Q learning, we use a buffer, and we just grab randomly from that buffer, right? Whatever information is in there. Might not be the best way, isn't it? So maybe it's valid to think about which information I apply from my model. And that is what prioritized sweeping does. So, um, like we discussed already in our maze example, um, where we compared these 50 planning steps to zero planning steps, um, that many in the beginning of the training many updates were some kind of senseless because you update zero values on zero values and only the last one was a non-zero value and if you have a large state and action space like that's the second point here maybe it's uh, not that likely that you grab that information which is valid for a good update in Dyna if you sample random from your model so from your experience and maybe it's a more clever way in that case like which somewhat relates to the idea of the update of in dynamic programming, like a little bit of backward focusing. If you have an uh, episodic task, that we somewhat back up from the goal, but we want to introduce here prioritized sweeping in a somewhat more general form, which could you use also in continuous tasks. And we think about to priorit uh, prioritize our experience we draw from the buffer based on the impact they will have to the value update. And we can simply calculate that from our learning algorithm, we will see in a second. And that method is called prioritized sweeping. So um, what it does, it builds up a queue for all that stage action pairs and throw it into a buffer, what we have done so far somewhat. But before that, we weight this experience by the prioritize of the change that experience will make to that state action pair. And um, yeah, we neglect everything which has minor impact. For example, all that zero update stuff. Pretty algorithm again. So um, let's just see how it works and then see how it works in an example. Um, 
It's in the beginning a little bit simple to diner. So again, learning rate and n. We have a new parameter here called theta. Uh, theta. This is our threshold. Um, we initialize our q uh, values somewhat. We have a model at hand, and we have an empty q called q. And yeah, then we start the learning. So um, we take an action like before. We put that to our uh, model, which is just store that experience in the buffer, and then that's new that here we uh, calculate the uh, the priority that update will have if you think about the update rule down here like you you change the um, the the weight that state action pair has in our matrix so in our q functions based on of course of alpha and on that term right and if this term is zero we will not change this so we will not learn from that so that's our priority, like um, that's somewhat related to um, the TD error. And then we will see, okay, if that priority, if the change is higher than my threshold, I can somewhat adjust. Um, then I insert the state action pair into Q with that priority P. So the amount of change I will make by the update. Yeah, and then you start here um, the planning until that queue you've just used is not empty. So um, you sort first the queue by, um, by the parameter of P to start with the experience which has the highest impact. Grab that state action pair you want to use in your model, then grab the experience from your model, and then do an update with that highest probable um, experience. And since we just see in the line above here that the value of the state action function the next state here has has input in, in uh, uh, influences the um, state action value of the state before that, it might be a good idea to check if we have changed this value, like um, what what happens to the uh, state action value of the pre decaso states. So we, put, we check all the state action pairs which have led to the state. I've just improved with my learning here and from our model predict the reward from that and check, okay, how much priority does this have now with our new updated um, well, um, with our new updated Q function, and if that has an impact, I put all that state state action pairs into that Q again and use this for learning here. Okay. Yeah, this is maybe a little hard, but it becomes clear if you think about linking between that x k plus one and x k or i. It's called here, um, but the basic idea of prioritize sweeping is just not draw randomly from that buffer, but first think about it. You apply then some kind of change here, and if you already know for out of your experience, that change will be nothing that don't do it. Just like do what's valid. That's, that's um, the most change here. And like I just said, what we have changed is our search strategy, right? We now, so we now prioritize our update and based on the predicted value change, we start with that with highest impact. We added a new hyperparameter, which is theta, like where you can adjust the sensitivity of the algorithm, the prediction uh, regarding x i prime, which I just tried to explain Below, with that update rule, we do some kind of backward search in our tree we have in our model and see, like, if I change a value down here, what is the impact to the other states which are before that? And yeah, like ever, this is for a deterministic environment application. Since we just use a replay buffer for a stochastic, you can use like that um, distributional model. OK, OK, 
questions to prioritize sweeping algorithm itself or shall we take a look how it works? Yeah. Maybe one stupid question to the algorithm might not be directly update them if we have a large field. But in the last for loop for this like recursive mm -hmm. reoccurring state. Mm -hmm. If we already know that we have a huge Here. chain exactly there, why do we insert them Q instead of directly updating them if we know we have huge change there? Good question you somewhat do. So, um, I mean, you do not go up here and take the next action. You do this here till your queue is empty, right? So, um, if there would be in your model only one state which led to that state you just changed, then you would just put it uh, here or calculate the priority, put that in the queue. There are no other states. You hop up here. Okay, you will grab that one from their model and learn from that. But it's just like you first collect all the um, all the states which have led to the state you just changed. And I mean, if you, for example, think about it, you have maybe let's say we have the time to just figure out the values of all the other states because this which led to that state because that's quite quick. But we only have time left for one update because, like, updating, we change some values. It might take some time, right? Um, and if there are now three states which led to that state, and the first one has not that much impact, a little bit, but um, I mean, maybe the third state has, has more, and you would have the time to figure out all the priorities of that. But directly update the first one and your time is over for planning then you would not update the state with the highest priority yeah. right yeah. yeah good good question clear for everyone else like this same 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 idea to the search strategy even in that case like take the smartest Other questions to our changed search strategy? Okay, if not the case, it's maybe valid to um, compare it with our standard algorithm DynaQ. So, uh, what we have done here is we have applied our both algorithms, DynaQ and Prioritize Sweeping, to the figure 7.7. .7. Okay. Um, remember, there was the first grid world or maze where the agent has uh, three optic obstacles where we thought about that different types of zero planning and 50 planning, right? Where you just have to navigate through the maze. It didn't change. It's all over again. Um, but now the maze size changes. So the maze gets bigger and maybe added new obstacles. And both met methods have here five planning steps available. And what we see here on the x-axis is like the grid world size, where the beginning, what we saw, I think is somewhere around here. And here are the updates needed. So the um, updates I would assume interactions plus planning um, till we can come up with an optimal solution but somewhat okay because both can do five planning steps. And what we see here, that prioritized sweeping is much faster than DynaQ, even like somewhat around about five to 10 times quicker in average in applications um, than the DynaQ algorithm, just out of grab clever from your buffer and not just random, right? Which is Quite valid in the beginning because when everything is zero in your buffer, but one, then grab that one and you are faster with the learning at the beginning. Okay. Is this clear? Or, I mean, if this is not enough, we can even hop to the example, but I think maze examples we all know now, right? Cool. All right. 
great. So um, now we have combined direct reinforcement learning methods, which interact with the environment and learn from experience with some kind of figuring out how we can come up with a quite easy model to improve our learning in a way, right? Um, that's And that way we can think of that we used somewhat past experience we have gathered um, to reapply it. And now we will change this direction of our view into the future and discuss a little bit about planning at decision time. Great, I just said that, right? Okay, um, yeah, back, so, so far we've done background planning, pre, uh, planning to reapply experience. We have discussed that this is like feasible for applications where you have low latency. So like in the control example, maybe of, um, of the LC filter, we have, I don't know, millimicroseconds of time and um, they are just reapply the experience we have is maybe a clever way, old experience from the past. Um, but yeah, what? And now we will somewhat change our uh, view of directions. And instead of what we've done here, is using that experience to optimize a policy. And that policy then gives us our actions we should choose in a state action pair, right? So um, we have somewhat indirectly optimized or taken an optimized action choice by improving a policy with the experience we've learned. And now, if we have a model available, you might say, okay, I am in a current state and um, I don't know. Uh, I think David Silva has this example while cli climbing, up, climbing up a mountain. And uh, your policy tells you like it's a good idea to uh, do it like that, grab in that way. And now you have the model at hand and you use your, let's assume, perfect knowledge about your mountain you will climb. And that will predict you for the future values um, that one of the rocks might be loose. And it's not a clever idea to take that actions ever and ever again, but maybe grab over there, right? And uh, that you figured out while looking into the future and not figuring out what I've learned from the past. And that's called planning at decision time. So we are in a state, we have to make a decision right now, and we will use our model to plan what impact that will have, like to take action right or take action le left in the future. And... Yeah, typically mm, you will then, if you transit to the next state, discard like uh, all the planning stuff you have made before. By the way, this is basically somewhat the idea of model predictive control, if you have know that. And I think Oliver uh, told about this in the first lecture, comparison about model predictive control. I think it was just min-max and an optimization function, um, but, but now in a reinforcement learning manner. And in the end, we will see that we can maybe improve this point here by not forgetting all and discarding all we learned, like model predictive control does, but, but maybe learn planning policy from that and try to improve this. Yeah, um, the, the cool thing is yeah, um, that maybe if trajectories are independent, it's easy to parallelize. So you can just calculate on different threads on your computer to the future and come up with a faster result. Um, but that typically takes time. And I think MPC guys can sing a song on that, that like the prediction horizon steps, how it's called there, like it's, they always wish that they could increase that, but typically to your hardware, it's not possible in control. And um, that's why, I mean, this is, quite useful in turn-based games for for example if you think about i mean i'm no chess nerd but let's let's think about we're playing chess and i saw once that there's some kind of clock you have to hit on and i assume now on my chess game i have five minutes till i have to make a move on the chessboard and i would have some kind of chess simulator in my pocket which shows like the the state here and i want want to move the queen <laughs> um, right now, so which move would be the best? 
And um, yeah, then I could use that five minutes just to simulate a lot of trajectories of this match, assuming a policy from my opponent to somewhat maybe in a cheating way figuring out which move is the best. And that's like basically what David Silver did with, I think, that Alpha Go stuff we will figure out in the end, which was kind of a breakthrough. But you need time for that. Um, and maybe to mention, we will only scratch here at the surface. So I will show you on the next three or four slides now a few ideas of how to predict the future based on the idea we developed just with our model. But we will not really go into details because like, there are lectures on all of the ideas by itself. So it's just, just an overview, okay? So, um, yeah. Easiest way would be just use our model for a stupid heuristic search. So you do some kind of tree-like continuation. You are in that state. That's my chessboard. And um, I, I want to go the queen to the right or to the left. Maybe you have more opportunities on chess and that's how it increases and that's what you need the time for. Um, and in heuristic searches then you travel through that tree. So you play with your simulator, your game somewhat and see like you stop here or it terminated and you take other actions and you build up some kind of tree which is somewhat back to the idea of dynamic programming. And when your time is over, you based on your model and an approximated value function, which could be, I don't know, you could apply Monte Carlo if you reach like a termina terminal state or you can apply TD methods uh, to evaluate how good that was you have done with your model down here. And then you can calculate, is it better to go right or to go left? And then you take that action. And then maybe you go to the right, then your, it, uh, your environment leads you to, the, to that state. That would be your choice, opponent choice, then you're here. Then you typically do this you know, heuristic search from scratch again and just discard the whole tree. So it's just use the model and predict based on reinforcement learning how good it was. But yeah, that's it. That's stupid not learning here. Um, yeah, like just said, you can... Um, use reinforcement learning methods to evaluate this. And instead of doing a heuristic search, you can even follow a rollout policy here. So if you are like, you, you take an action which led you by randomness to this state, you just from there on follow a policy down till termination several times for several actions to figuring out how it, good it was to come up in that state here. Mm. That rollout policy could be anything. Easiest choice would be just a random policy. So if you have table-based methods, like it's just random numbers in, in your tabular, and you would be surprised that even this could lead to good results if you use it in a clever way. But we've linked some, some lectures for that if you want to learn more about it. Um, yeah. Then in case of you use Monte Carlo, uh, you average over that, back it up and figuring out which choice was the best and then you take the best choice, discard everything and start from scratch again. And yeah, since we already used the policy here, it might be a good idea not to discard like all the stuff we've used and seen before in our simulation. So from down here, this is all like model-based simulation stuff. Um, but use this information to um, learn from your model. So we now, and, and that's called Monte Carlo Tree Search here. A Monte Carlo Tree Search basically has two policies. It has a tree policy and the rollout policy. Rollout policy is the same like we've seen on the other slide. We are in a state, and the goal is just to quickly finish the episode down to bits, then we know, okay, information about that episode and we use that information. But in, instead of only doing that, we uh, somewhat have a tree policy which gets improved based on the information we've learned from that rollout within our simulation step before we take an action on the real environment. So this is all planning here. So it basically has uh, four steps. You typically have that selection step, uh, sta uh, stage, 
where you are in that state. That's my chessboard. And uh, now in the real world, I, I want to know, shall I go, I don't know, straight with my queen back or to the right, whatever. And then I, in my simulation model of my chess simulator, I take a few actions and how many it's like depending on the real algorithm you would implement. If you're interested in like uh, follow the link to that lecture for that. So um, in this case, we just applied one and two actions here um, in our tree policy. And this tree policy we will update later on. Then you have an expansion step where you typically can expand um, your, um, your tree a little bit more till you stop down here in the leaf node. Or you can do a little bit more fancy stuff. I can recommend the paper from uh, DeepMind where they explain how AlphaGo works. It's quite interesting. Um, yeah, and then you stop in that leaf node. And from there on, you just follow some kind of whatever random policy. To till till your game, so till our chess game terminates, and then you back based on Monte Carlo up till uh, till the leaf node up here, or at least, of course, till your action you want to take. How good it was to take that action, but you discard everything for the updates you've done with the roller policy. But you increase or uh, update the values of that tree policy to. Somewhat use the information you gathered from simulation to maybe explore during your simulation steps a little bit more clever instead of random. And yeah, that's one step. And if you still have time to run your simulator, chess simulator in your pocket, you do this once again, once again, once again. And yeah, I think, yeah, now mm, just. Quickly, let's summarize here the different steps. So you have a selection step where you start at a root node, use your tree policy. So root node, I have my chess play, uh, chess game, and I want to know where to go. Um, you do it with your simulator some, somewhat to use and use your tree policy, which might have learned already something about your simulated game, and you exploit all suspicious tree regions. And um, yeah, maybe you can use this in every simulation run based on the improved tree policy from now on in your simulation. You can do expansion, just mentioning, and then what's called here simulation is just uh, run the rollout policy till the end to gather like or to, to get to know with your Monte Carlo how good it was, back it up. Yeah. That could be kind of random, and then you back it up and update only the tree policy to interact a little bit more clever in your planning. And later on, of course, you wanted to know when you're ready with your pocket simulator, like which move to go on your chessboard. And uh, then the question is, okay, which move do I take? And obviously you can take the, the, the move which has the highest uh, state action value or another idea would be the move which you have seen the most so uh, because you have maybe the most information about this maybe not take it if it's bad but uh, could be also an idea mm. yeah after that when you applied that move to your real world you then um, start from a new state and the whole procedure of that simulation and learning that tree policy restarts and there might be a chance that you see some regions where you have already been in your planning tree policy and before, and you can maybe use this. But like mentioned, um, don't be frustrated when this was quite a fast and because this was just to give you an overview and an idea what can we do with the methods we just learned so far if we use this for an MPC like planning. But yeah, there are all lectures only about that topic. Here is a link where uh, David Silver tells about that famous AlphaGo algorithm, which was able, I think, in two, uh, 2016 to be much, much better than the uh, world champion in, in that uh, quite complex game uh, Go, which has a 
huge state and action space, so there you typically work then with function approximators next week. And I think we have linked to you as well some um, other courses here from Stanford, MIT or Paris, where they are dealing with ideas which go more into detail here, but that shouldn't be focus of our lecture because we have here at the university other lectures dealing with like model predictive control stuff, but just to give a link on that. Okay. Questions to that? If that's not the case, let's think about what we hopefully have learned today. Um, Model-free reinforcement learning is easy to implement. Only one task could be fast, and it cannot suffer from model learning, uh, from model errors, um, model learning errors. Uh, yeah, because it simply just don't use a model. And model-based approaches can use limited amount of experience, much more efficient if they have a model. And that was the motivation to combine both of them to somewhat integrate direct and re, uh, indirect reinforcement learning and learning and planning while identifying a model in that Dyna framework here where we have used as direct reinforcement learning Q-learning. The model was a simple replay buffer. You can throw much more complicated stuff in there, but that's sufficient like we saw. Search control, like um, we've discussed this. We've just started with just randomly or maybe do it in a, a little bit more clever way um, in prioritize sweeping and then we have discussed about DynaQ and DynaQ plus for maybe figuring out what happens if the environment changes and how can we uh, improve this a little bit more and prioritize sweeping I just mentioned as well to learn from our model in a more clever way and yeah on the last point we just wrapped around changed our viewpoint from backward information learning to how can we predict what shall we do right now directly on which action to take instead of indirectly in the backward pass like optimizing our policy which then tells us which action we should take and there yeah if you're interested in that part i can recommend the, the links on the other slides quite cool Question after the uh, two classes that I have two. We talked about uh, how uh, why is there a difference? Is there the same? Yeah. Same exploration? Or is uh, the same exploration uh, capturing more dynamic than the other stuff? Is that the uh, weighting of the that relates to the to the question from from you right or maybe yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, that's true. Um, of course, wait, if we... Ah, okay, great. There we do not have an algorithm. Okay. Um, yeah, um, yeah, that's true. It both only use that epsilon greedy for exploration, for somewhat direct exploration, instead of a use with epsilon probability, not optimal action. Um, this, yeah, somewhat visiting states I haven't seen for a while here. Is, is more motivated a little bit indirectly by this offset here, right? So uh, that's, that's this tau somewhat hopefully limited by, by that uh, square root function increases by the time I haven't seen it. And if by random exploration, which is same, um, the DynaQ plus agent visited, then, um, then maybe the state over here and sees, okay, um, or let's it, it by random exploration it just visited that state then 
then it gets not only the reward of zero, but a little bit of offset. And inside the policy, it then, during the time, just biases itself a little bit in thinking that it's better to go there based on that reward, right? And if it then sees, okay, next time, ah, it was good to go there, um, but I've been there just once before, then that tau factor would be near, nearly zero, so I won't, it wouldn't affect us, and then it will learn, oh, there's a wall. It wasn't good, that good as I saw it, so it will correct it again. Um, on the other side, if it can go through, then it uh, yeah, will see, okay, that was really better, and we'll take that path. So uh, for me, it's like a little bit more of indirect exploration by biasing the policy depending on that time factor with the offset in the reward in one sentence <laughs> that's not too okay, so, uh, the it should converge both yes it's the same I'm I'm still somewhat with you that when you like add on and on uh, a factor to your reward, you will still explore maybe some other regions which costs you something. But hmm, I don't know. For me as an engineer, I would throw maybe a linear a linear scalar on that kappa factor, and um, yeah. But hmm, good good point. For, for discussion, but yeah, in, in, in case of epsilon greedy action, action selection, they are both the same, so that's correct. And they should both converge by that uh, policy improvement theorem stuff to the optimal one in the future. But yeah, I don't know, maybe you can build up some examples and investigate on that a little bit more. <laughs> cool. Other other questions, comments? Can turn off the camera and then you can ask. <laughs> All right. Yeah.